Hi, everyone. Um, I think since we have just a quick hour today, we should uh, get started. Um, for those of you who have not met or don't know, my name is Sarah Benet Weiser. I'm um, a faculty member here at uh, Annenberg um, School for Communication, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I want to kind of begin our conversation about gender by first thanking uh, the Dean, John Jackson, and other people at Annenberg for kind of focusing these conversations um, in the last couple of years on some of the you know, really urgent issues, cultural issues uh, that we're all facing um, at, the, at this time. And this, as you know, is part of the conversation about gender at Annenberg. Um, I uh, am absolutely delighted to um, introduce Dr. Francesca Sobande. Um, who is a faculty member at uh, Cardiff University in Wales, um, uh, where she works on digital media, um, uh, black feminism and, is, uh, and, and activism, and is also the undergraduate director of the Media, Journalism and Culture program. Dr. Sobande is a prolific scholar and activist. She's written about so many things in the kind of realm of digital activism and gender and race, um, including Black women on YouTube, uh, digital representation of Black women, and um, also a fantastic article on the Internet Boyfriend. I recommend everyone read that. Um, uh, we're going to focus most of our discussion today on, um, on her latest book, uh, the Digital Lives of Black Women in Britain, which came out in 2020. Um, but she has also uh, co-edited a, a book called To Exist is to Resist, Black Feminism in Europe, has another book coming out, um, Black Oot Here, Black Lives in Scotland. And yes, Francesca, you can you know congratulate me later for my Scottish accent there. Um, and, and another um, book, forthcoming book, which is also something that we're going to be talking about today, coming out with University of California Press um, called The Revolution Will Not Be Digital Branding. That's a tentative title um, or a potential title, and but it, I think it speaks very clearly about what the book is about. So um, Dr. Sobande has been an absolute model uh, for me in thinking about what it means to do digital activism, how do we write about it, how to, how to practice it, how to think about it, what are its political effects. Um, we've been discussing um, this um, in my PhD seminar, um, especially the kind of tensions and contradictions involved in media representations of marginalized groups. Um, and so it's, you know, thinking about your work alongside other people's work, such as our own Sarah Jackson, who writes uh, so eloquently about hashtag activism, and Moya Bailey and her digital alchemy um, uh, formulation. It's just been, it's just a real thrill to have you here um, to discuss, um, you know, some of this stuff and to be in dialogue with you. So welcome to Annenberg. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today as part of this discussion. And I also just want to say I'm really appreciative of such a such a, a generous introduction as well, and really looking forward to all that we will have to speak about today and the, the different questions that connect to digital culture, activism, consumer culture, and everything in between. Great. Okay. So so in terms of kind of housekeeping stuff, um, we're, Francesca and I are going to talk for about, hopefully about 35, 40 minutes. We want to leave time for questions because I know there will be lots of them. Um, and I'll moderate um, the, if you could put your questions in the chat. Um, and then I will, if, if you're comfortable with this, I will ask you to read out your question um, as we go through them. Um, so uh, we're also going to kind of flip the order of the abstract a bit. Um, uh, and when, when, when uh, Francesca and I were talking about how to structure this um, conversation, um, we thought that it made sense to kind of talk a little bit historically about media representations of race and um, gender first. So, um, you know, you have written about how it's important to focus on Black women in your work. Uh, because of things like creativity and knowledge production, um, activism, 
resistance, right? But it also you one of the one of the really wonderful nuances in your work is how you situate this kind of creativity and knowledge production within a general capitalist and consumer culture. And also talk about the ways in which that knowledge production and that creativity is co-opted, um, appropriated, trivialized, and used um, for purposes um, that are, you know, kind of profit-making purposes rather than actual resistance. And and, and it, it's interesting to see how, you know, how the kind of historical arc of these media representations has taken place in the mainstream media. On the slide right now are some ads that I use to teach um, when I teach about consumer culture and branding and advertising and, you know, kind of representations of race um, and, and, and gender within advertising. And you can see the sort of blatant uh, racism, blatant orientalism, blatant kind of co-opting of this. I, you know, I, I kind of go back and forth between wondering which is my favorite, the white women in underpants picking cotton for guests or the, you know, the white woman in a bikini in Africa with the Maasai, right? And the ways in which these were seen as completely unproblematic um, appropriations of particular cultural norms and practices and bodies um, um, through, throughout advertising and brand culture. Um, but it does seem like, you know, representations of race and gender in the media from the 20, 20th century those kind of racist uh, uh, media transmute, transmutes into another kind of racist media, right? Um, or a, a media that also kind of appropriates and trivial, trivializes, but also that responds to a conjuncture, a global racial reckoning, if you will, and figures out how to harness that reckoning into something that is you know, wrenched away from justice issues and put into kind of profit and, um, and uh, consumer culture. So this you have coined um, in this beautiful way, woke washing. And so um, I'm gonna turn it over to you to kind of talk to us through what woke, what woke washing is and what are, what's the significance of thinking about it critically. Yeah, so I think, as you said there, what's really one of the many interesting aspects of what's going on is we can trace a lot of these issues to previous decades. And this term woke washing, essentially, it's a term that is used to highlight the, the, the explicitly um, capitalist oriented ways we see organizations, brands, essentially trying to tap into rhetoric representations that relate to social justice issues, and in particular, often um, black activism and racial justice organizing in ways that ultimately dilutes and reframes the liberationist politics they're trying to position themselves in proximity to and repackages it as something marketable and something that's ultimately about promoting a product or a service. So with this slide, several different examples that come to mind, thinking especially about 2017 and around about that time where we saw the, the Pepsi and Kendall Jenner advert that sparked a lot of justified backlash and, and criticism. And also around that same sort of time, we've got the in the, um, the, the bottom half of the slide next to the Ben and Jerry's image, this image which relates to a Shea Moisture campaign, which really was sort of moving towards this for everybody message and um, pushing this product that had historically been associated with black people with black hair and suddenly trying to um, reach a, a different audience in, in this, this way that really much really feels as though it connects to these questions to do with social justice activism, diversity, intersectionality as well. So I know part of this conversation today involves reflecting on how we've seen feminist advertising or so-called femvertising develop. And I think one of the clear changes we have seen occur is brands very much try to engage with different demographics, not only in ways that relate to gender identity, sexuality, other aspects of identity, but race and ethnicity. And certainly in the context of Britain, where quite recently, really, we've seen brands try to frame themselves as being for the black consumer, for the black women. There have been moments where I'm asking myself a question, to what extent is this organization invested in addressing issues to do with anti-blackness, issues to do with inequalities, um, or to what extent are they actually pushing a capitalist message, um, maybe sometimes a black capitalist message, and suggesting that that's where liberationist goals are to be found. So certainly woke washing this term and variations of it, in some ways it's nothing new, 
but I do think we've seen how social media and digital technology has impacted what's going on, including the power of the critiques that people voice online and then the swiftness that we see um, brands make use of when they remove a campaign or they, they post that apology that's very rarely a well thought through message and much more of a, a shallow attempt to, to manage um, the, the, the fallout that ensues. Yeah, can I can I ask you a question about that fallout and what you, how you see the kind of backlash to some of this, um, you know, um, some of the backlash that really comes from Black communities, like the Kendall Jenner, the Pepsi ad. I mean, there was such a swift backlash because it it, it really is so awful um, um, in so many ways, um, and also you know the representations of Black people in that ad do more harm than you know than actually kind of giving them even a capitalist sort of advertising based you know recognition and so um the, you know the the uh the black tuesday the instagram um uh, uh campaign that you have on there which was ostensibly meant to recognize the global movement of black lives matter also had a pretty swift black backlash especially when corporations who have you know centuries of discriminatory hiring policies and labor policies um you know are putting you know you know banks and other places just putting this kind of black square on their instagram account for one day and people have talked about how that also erases the work that black lives matter has done so can you talk a little bit about the pushback to these kinds of woke washing and femvertising yeah so i, I i'm conscious that depending on the, the example of the case, some people might say for some brands, there's no such thing as bad press. And um, I think at this point in time, how often that's true or applicable, I'm not sure. But I would say that certainly what we are seeing is brands responding in a way that perhaps they weren't as quick to previously. And um, I think with digital technology and the rise of social media, on the one hand, brands can be quick to issue a statement, be quick to portray themselves as listening to um, or responding to, to critiques. But on the other hand, that also means they can be quick to, to post something that just really highlights the fact that they don't know what they're talking about. Um, overnight, they're wanting to contribute to conversations to do with structural inequality and oppression that they've been complicit in and haven't thought it through. So I do feel as though we're at a point, without overstating the impact of consumer backlash or, or critiques voiced online, we are at a point where we're seeing such critiques really disrupting the, the overall image of a brand and disrupting it to such an extent, again, depending on the brand and how established they are, how, how successful they are, um, but just certainly disrupting things to such an extent that they cannot ignore that. And I feel as though I, I wouldn't want to use words such as accountability because to what extent can brands ever be accountable when we're dealing with these questions to do with racial capitalism? But certainly the pushback is, is something that I think we're only going to see more of. And studies do highlight that when people are making decisions in relation to um, consumption, in relation to media, the content they engage with, questions to do with social and political issues and the perceived genuineness in terms of a brand stance really can shape the decisions that are made. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree that we're in this, you know, kind of interesting and possibly generative moment um, in terms of, of, you know, kind of a, a public and counter public backlash and pushback and resistance that also happens um, on, you know, on digital media, right? Um, and so, so, so if we could, I'd like to kind of move into talking about that different forms of that pushback and different forms of that um, resistance um, and think about digital activism and um, especially black women um, and digital activism. And, and, you know, I can't help but think um, when when I'm reading your book of the um, for those of you who aren't haven't been in the UK over the last couple of years, the Sewell report, uh, which was a government commissioned report to look into um, race and racism in the UK, and they came out with the conclusion that you know the the the, the actually the kind of um, core of the report is that there is no evidence for institutionalized racism in the UK. Um, something that, you know, there was a ton of, of course, outrage and, um, and a response to, especially in higher ed, where the statistics are so abysmally low for um, uh, Black faculty, Black British faculty in the UK, something like 2% of all of the UK 
um, are um, uh, in terms of professors are black women. And so, so, you know, kind of your work really challenges this claim in lots of ways because it, it, uh, it really uncovers and interrogates the different subtle and not so subtle ways in which racism is institutionalized in the UK and elsewhere. Um, but it also foregrounds the various ways um, in which, um, in, in your particular work in which black women resist and create um, own, you know, kind of their own representations um, that challenge um, and contradict mainstream um, British media representations, um, especially in digital forms. And again, this this work has such great ties with the the, the you know incredibly generative work that is being done in the U.S. on um, on Black women and digital activism, like Sarah Jackson, like Moya Bailey, like Brooke Foucault Wells, like Trudy, um, and so um, uh, Catherine Steele. So um, I was wondering if you could just talk us through a little bit of of you know your the impetus for this book and how you're seeing digital activism. Yeah, thank you. I, I think one of the main motivations behind the, the book and the research and some of the questions I was asking myself and asking other people in, in relation to digital activism was the fact that in the context of Britain, often there's this myth of exceptionalism that is pushed, especially I would say within the context of devolved nations such as Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So there's often this message of that racism, that's, that's not something that exists here, that's over there, that's elsewhere in, in the US, maybe in England, but not here. And just my frustration in, in terms of constantly coming up against those sorts of narratives meant that when doing this work, not only was I thinking about the fact that, of course, that's you know completely false and um, structural racism in Britain has existed for such a long time and is informed by both the specifics of that historical context um, and, and also the, the global histories that it's connected to. And I was also just thinking about how much I'd learned myself by going online, by connecting um, with other Black women, by you know, reading incredible blog posts by reading so many different pieces that were often absent in formal educational spaces across all years and were, were definitely glaringly absent in many mainstream media contexts. And what I found as part of that work really spanning from around about 2015 to 2020 was there were these glimmer, these, these sort of um, glimmers of hope and these, these really enriching, exciting moments when people were creating content, they were sharing narratives, they were doing the work of archiving with the use of digital technology and online platforms but at the same time they were also you know facing forms of harassment facing forms of erasure and they were very rarely able to access the sort of funds and resources that mainstream media in Britain and um, ac academia as well and formal educational spaces have access to themselves so thinking about all of this in the slide that I'm sharing here I was also just thinking about different campaigns that people have called out so we had um, Boohoo did this hashtag all girls campaign, which was meant to push this message of inclusivity and diversity. And people were saying, you know, where, where are people um, with different textures of hair? Where are darker skinned women? Where are women um, with, with, with a different embodied physical appearance? And time and time again, we're seeing the work of black women at the, the forefront of, of these critiques and at the forefront of messaging that really contributes to key cultural shifts and changes in the UK, not only within these sectors, but across society in general. So maybe to sort of wrap that point up, I feel as though whilst doing this work, I've always been thinking about um, knowledge production and work and labor that is a part of all of this and what it means when so often the, the work of black women in Britain, black women in the US and elsewhere um, is erased, is reframed, is whitewashed and is only sort of engaged with in, in a meaningful way when it's presented by somebody else who's never gonna be on the receiving end um, of, of any of these forms of inequality and oppression we're speaking about. So, so, and, 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 you know, this, I think that this is um, a really important critique, especially the all the, you know, the kind of the, the that neoliberal gesture towards inclusivity that we see across all sectors um, globally, you know, from, from diversity workshops in higher ed and, and that, that are kind of top down workshops to, um, to challenges to things um, like Black Lives Matter with the sort of liberalist um, neoliberal um, kind of erasure of the historical specificity of Black lives um, in the US with the hashtag all lives matter and that kind of thing. So I think that this is a really important 
critique um, of the ways in which some of these um, campaigns feature this sort of, again, this sort of liberalist notion of inclusivity and how that works like whiteness often does as a you know ever narrowing parameter of who fits into that all, right? Who gets to be included in that category of all. So, so um, I think it's a very important critique. And, and can you like, so, so what are some of the different kinds of digital media activism that push back at sort of this, that actually recognize the historical specificity of um, structural racism of history, you know, what are some of the examples that you have found in your work? Yeah, so I think some of the really key examples are those examples that relate to forms of archiving. So, you know, sometimes people will say, I don't know about the history of um, Black women in Scotland, or I don't know about the history of Black women in Wales. And when you're going to national archives, when you're going to different institutional um, spaces, you know, seldom are you finding that information, finding the resources. So I think to draw on the work of um, Stuart Hall on, on living archives, I think the digital plays a really central role in the, the Black diaspora living archives, um, again, in Britain, in, in the US and, and elsewhere. And whether that's how people are documenting um, and, and recording different sort of personal items, photographs from the past, and also sometimes when we speak about digital activism, the emphasis can be on what's very public or very visible, but certainly especially over these last two years with the work that I've been doing and thinking about in the UK, these marketed messages of we're all in this together and we're all experiencing things in the same way. I, I know there have been so many important examples of digital activism that people aren't aware of, which are intentionally um, obscured, which are kept under, underground in certain ways um, in order to protect people and because we know activism is, is, it's the grind, it's the chipping away, it's not always what makes it to a tweet. So I would say archiving um, forms of community and, and forms of more intimate spaces that are being created with the use of digital platforms. It's not always about a huge audience or a huge number of people coming together. If anything, based on some of my own experiences, it's, it's sometimes a small group of people who are, are figuring out ways to share resources, to pull resources, and also to support others who are already doing that work. Yeah, I think that, you know, the, 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 the kind of focus on excavation, on a historical excavation and archiving and, and thinking about what are some of the counter narratives and counter representations. And, and, I, and I, also, I also appreciate that this could be a small group um, working online or this could be, main, you know, something like mainstream media. I know, I know you've also thought about, um, um, Issa Rae and and thinking about um, um, you know like her you know her journey from and and Moya Bailey talks about this too in Misogynoir Transformed uh, from from you know someone who had a GoFundMe right to produce Awkward Black Girl and then gets an HBO contract. So do you want to talk a little bit about that as an example? Yeah, so I think that's a, a really powerful example. And, you know, as somebody who's sort of followed right the way from the web series and through to present day, it's been incredible to witness and, and, and to watch. And thinking about, I guess, GoFundMe's or crowd fundraising in the context of the pandemic, I know there's some interesting research out there which suggests that sometimes those who are most likely to be able to benefit the most from that um, are, are still sometimes least likely to be the most marginalized. So there are really interesting questions around when somebody is able to, to um, access resources in a particular way and is able to you know, develop a platform or develop a, a career with the use of these different tools and how sometimes the message within the media can be that this is accessible to everybody as opposed to the unfortunate reality that typically people are, are the exception um, as opposed to a scene that the landscape shifting itself. But I also think it's interesting just coming back to some of these questions around woke washing as well, when we've seen brands who perhaps would never have been interested in, you know, whether it's a web series in its early stages or, or the work of a writer, producer and creator um, before it, it, it sort of pierced the mainstream and um, suddenly now wanting to tap into that. So whether or not it's in this case, I'm thinking a bit about also just how in the context of the UK, we're seeing brands often during Black History Month um, as opposed to throughout the year, wanting to be part of conversations to do a black glove um, or, or you know, reflecting on the different ways we see organizations, whether it's Google, whoever it is, um, tapping into to terms such as black girl magic or, or different expressions which, which really focus on 
black cultural experiences and, and were never about um, commodification or, or commercialization and in, in, in the way we've seen them sort of take shape in the marketplace. Yeah, and unfortunately, I mean, I, you know, I, I think also, like, again, like we've talked about a little bit earlier, a lot of uh, that that marketplace has such a strong pull, right? So I'm thinking of, you know, different products now that are kind of labeled with with Black Girl Magic and, and thinking about some of the um, ways in which the visibility and recognition of of, you know, kind of these, the, these sorts of digital activism can also be um, sort of a trap, right? Um, and and uh, again, you know, in, in, in my class this semester, we're talking a lot about the contradictions and tensions between um, visibility and invisibility and hyper visibility. Um, and, you know, your, your edited volume, your co-edited volume is called to exist is to resist, right? And so I wonder if, you know, what you think about how, how we should think as media scholars um, and feminist scholars and critical race scholars about what to do with visibility um, and recognition. Um, you know, the media scholar Herman Gray has talked about this and has said, you know, what we look at the media scape now and what you see is a proliferation of difference. Right, a proliferation of these images, um, and so much so that it distracts us or could distract us from actual structural, you know, issues. So again, back to the UK, this idea that there is no institutional racism, denying the xenophobia that fueled um, and racism that fueled Brexit, denying Windrush, denying the, like you said, the actual history of empire. You know, um, uh, you know. Um, how how do we how do we think through these t like vexed issues of visibility, invisibility, and hyper visibility? I feel as though you know your work on sort of the, the economy of visibility is, is so relevant here. And thinking about the UK, where people have said, you know, oh, the political landscape is is the most diverse it's ever been, and um, we're, we're seeing black and brown people represented in ways they haven't been represented before. But we're also dealing with this narrative that apparently there's no such thing as structural racism in the UK. I feel as though it really highlights how people often conflate visibility and surface level representation and with any sort of meaningful indication that there has been a structural shift, that there has been change. And I think that the economics of visibility here is, is a huge part of all of this and how that relates to racial capitalism. So on, on this slide, I, I suppose I was thinking about two very different examples, being mindful of how a brand like Fenty Beauty has been received relatively positively, although there are interesting and, and vital critiques out there, questions around work and labour practices and experiences. And then looking at how um, a brand like Pretty Little Thing um, tried to, to, to make a statement with the use of this image, with the use of, the, of these words, and you could say try to make themselves visible in that moment in a way which could benefit them um, economically. So yeah, I, I'm just really appreciative of the work of all, all the people that you've been referring to in your work as well, to really trouble these ideas to do with visibility and push back against the idea that um, visibility is, is, is a liberationist goal in and of itself. And to just sort of reflect once more on questions to do with the digital as part of all this, we know throughout history that those who are most marginalized, those who are most at risk, um, often do the work of, of, of trying to prevent themselves from being visible. So in the context of Britain, I know the work that I've done, I think a bit about the difference of, of the difference between being a black woman in Britain and being a black British woman. Questions to do with citizenship and um, to do with access to citizenship, to do with being in, in the context of a nation state where you're absolutely at, at risk with every single decision you make that might make you visible. So maybe my final thought on that is, yeah, how we, how we move away from and we continue these critiques of visibility. And I'm especially interested in discussions to do with opacity and, and, and what it means to, um, to, to push back against claims that just because we are not able to, to see something or just because we're not aware of something, especially in relation to activism, that it's not actually happening. Um, and to remember that the living archive is not always embodied, it's not always visible, it's not always legible, and that's often for some very important reasons. Yeah, I, I you know, over the past couple of years, um, thinking about this, I have been um, very humbled, I think, um, in, in, my, in my own work on this and thinking about my 
my, you know, the way I want to write about visibility critically, because there used to be this kind of thing that I would say to students, you know, like why we need to pay attention to representation, why representation still matters, right? Because because in a in in a context in which media representation gives a certain kind of identity and recognition, then how you are represented does matter, right? It matters in terms of all that. And then, but then as we are thinking about the digital scape and what those processes of visibility and and recognition, how they they contradict and how and um and highlight and spotlight some people to the ex exclusion and eclipse of others, it make it's a much more complicated process, you know, practice or or or, or, or kind of politics, right? So, so um, you know, I, I want to open it up to questions um, soon because I know people will have them, but I I guess as a way to kind of um, ask you, like, you know, I'm sorry, this is a, like the total, the, like the worst, hardest question ever. But um, I know that you work in, in a digital media lab and you have, and you actually do this kind of activism yourself. And so um, kind of pedagogically, how, how do you think about talking to students, teaching students, <clears throat> learning with students um, about, what it means to be a digital activist? That's a really brilliant question and I, I'm conscious there might be some of my students here today but two two things immediately come to mind. One is the role of reflexive writing. So I teach a module on memes and digital remix culture which includes um, digital journaling or you know thinking reflexively about our own digital experiences, our own digital habits. What does the term digital habits mean? And what does the term digital lives mean? And this year as part of that, we're also incorporating speculative fiction. So how can we through um, speculating about the, the future of digital technology, writing about digital technology in 20, 30, 40 years time, how can those sorts of um, writing activities help us to critically consider issues to do with digital technology um, in this present moment, reflect on the past as well? How might the future of digital technology for one person sound as though it's a really exciting and um, a potentially sort of enriching opportunity? Whereas another person's perception of what's discussed and described there, it might be anything but that. So I would say from a pedagogical point of view, as much room for creativity as possible and as much room for self-reflection and collaborative reflection too. So something I was involved in um, over these last few years with a good friend who's now at the University of Kentucky, um, Dr. Julie Serenay Wells, was we took part in this poetic exchange um, since about 2016, which was a mixture of posting each other poetry um, using digital technology to share the poetry with each other, reading it to each other. And I feel like I learned a lot from that about the fact that self-reflexive work can be incredibly collaborative in nature. And also that for some people turning to creative forms of self-expression and writing opens up really difficult questions and, and helps you to, to put things into words in a way that more conventional approaches, and I say conventional like that, because what do we really mean there? Um, but more conventional approaches to pedagogy and, and, and research sometimes close off. Um, yeah, I, and I think that I would also just like to emphasize um, the, the and, and people at Annenberg might think this is uh, self, interested or self-important because I have a new center for the co for collaborative communication. But I do think that um, kind of moving in, in our activism from um, moving from a position that is more individually based or individualist based into something that is about collaboration and sharing ideas and sharing platforms is is, you know, one way to think more generatively about the collective, um, you know, in, in, in a moment where sometimes it feels very uh, discouraging, you know, to think about this given what is happening um, around um, um, the world. Um, okay, so we could. I have other questions for you, but um, I um, I uh, I want to open it up now to questions. So if you if you write in the chat or you can write to me, um, I um, I do have a question um, uh, uh, from Joe Tarot from Professor Joe Tarot. So I will ask you that now. Joe, I'll just read it if that's okay. Um, uh, are there 
black owned ad agencies in the UK? And to what extent are their images and other outputs helpful departures from the norm? So I would say, I, I don't know that I could comfortably say there are definitely black owned, it, well, I suppose it depends what sort of ad agency or creative agency we're dealing with. So there are definitely black owned and black run um, PR firms. There, there are some black owned, um, you know, different groups that approach issues to do with media, marketing and advertising. But I would definitely say for the most part in the UK, what you're dealing with is a landscape that's predominantly white, when we're really looking at leadership, when we're looking at who gets to make those decisions. So I would also add to that, and connecting back to those questions to do visibility and representation, um, I'm aware of, and I feel like part of the message here is that it's never just about who is doing what, it's never just about whether it is, um, you know, a uh, thinking about the political landscape in Britain, a, a black conservative person who's making those decisions that actually negatively impact other black people. For me, it's also a question around politics, like we were seeing here, the politics of representation, the politics of the decisions that are made, and also issues to do with work and labor in an organizational setting. So sometimes I feel as though with an industry, the emphasis is on campaigns, the content of ads, who's represented there, but without knowing what's going on behind the scenes, without knowing who's benefiting and um, who's profiting from what and where that profit is going. I feel as though taking the images at face value doesn't tell us as much as, as we sometimes think it does. Yeah, and I would just add to that, um, we didn't really get into femvertising much, but um, that's also a case in point um, about, you know, kind of um, women or women I uh, led firms and campaigns that ostensibly are about kind of empowering women mm -hmm. and what that means in terms of corporate culture um, where it really isn't about um, any kind of liberation from um, from an institutionalized uh, sexism or misogynistic context, but rather about fitting in within an already established corporate culture that has been defined and maintained primarily by powerful white men. So, um, you know, the, the sort of all the different scandals in, in, the, in the genre of the girl boss and apparently the girl boss's demise, right? Where you find out that these women who had a great deal of visibility as people who were, you know, had women-centered companies and were, you know, uh, women only companies and who also, you know, were racist towards um, employees of color who had very questionable labor practices, mm -hmm. who actually worked in a kind of corporate model that was decidedly against the best interests of, of women um, in the workplace. So, so it's a, it's a, you know, like you said, Francesca, I mean, I think there's no guarantee, there's not a body guarantee here, right, mm -hmm. um, to what happens. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Sarah Jackson has um, um, a question. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and read that, Sarah, for you. Um, so uh, thanks for this, uh, Francesca. Great to see you. Um, can you talk a bit about how the specific politics of immigration and colonization mm -hmm. um, regarding the UK complicate the ways US scholars think about race and racism, gender and media? It's a great question. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And um, also, also goes without saying thank you for all the work that you do as well, because there's so many people here whose work has absolutely um, shaped my own. And I continue to learn so much from. So it's, it's really fantastic that, yeah, just to be able to have this conversation and think through all this stuff together. So I'd say in response to that question, the first thing that I'm thinking about is political blackness in the UK. So when dealing with um, archives, when looking at resources in the UK that relate to the lives of black people and questions to do with race, racism and gender in the media, because of how activism has developed in Britain, which includes um, the, the, this point in time when this, this notion of political blackness really took shape. And for anybody who's not familiar with that, this was a, a term and there's sort of variations of it, which were used to describe the experiences of and black and brown individuals, different racialized individuals who were working as part of a collective struggle against racism, against capitalism and against imperialism. And because of the use of this term and that coalitional politics, which is really interesting, and, and certainly I'm aware that coalitional politics isn't unique to the UK, but the way that this notion of political blackness has traveled means that at times when dealing with archives to do with black people, there is an extra layer to figure out um, within that term black who, who there is a black person of African descent and, and which experiences 
are discussed with the use of the word black, which aren't necessarily the experiences of black people. So I think the particular history of immigration and colonization in the UK and coalitional struggles against that means that when we are dealing with racial categories or we're dealing with the language that is used in relation to people, um, there is that need to both hold and recognize the coalitional politics that has occurred, but also try to also ensure specificity too. So when I've done work at the Black Culture Archives, for example, depending on at what point in time that piece was published, if it's closer to sort of maybe the 70s, 80s, when political blackness was much more at the forefront of things, I know that I might need to dig a little bit deeper to figure out um, which racial identities, which um, experiences in relation to ethnicity are being discussed here, and how can I account for the coming together that we've seen, but also the differences that exist between them. Yeah, I, I think uh, this. I, I think this is such an interesting question too. But we, we uh, we've I've been talking to students about it a bit um, um, this semester at um, Annenberg, and and thinking also about something like uh, cultural studies or critical race theory and how it it sort of travels or doesn't travel across mm -hmm. a UK US mm -hmm. border, um, which I think has a you know has some relationship with a historical relationship with political blackness mm -hmm. in 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 the UK and this idea somehow that um, also that colonization isn't part of critical race theory mm -hmm. in the United States because ostensibly this is not, you know, a country that colonizes, even though, mm -hmm. you know, it, of course that's not true, right? But there's these interesting way, like kind of entry points into this discussion that are really shaped by empire and colonialism and immigration in different ways, um, which is, you know, one of the reasons why I think, again, historical, historical specificity is so important to thinking about representation in the media, because they draw on these histories, um, the, these representations. Um, okay, uh, are, if, if there's, are there any question, other questions that we can- In, in, the, in the meantime, I was just gonna add something else to that, because yeah. it's, it's such a great question. And something else also in the context of the UK is, you'll find within devolved nations such as Wales and Scotland, there will be um, certain groups who will, who will claim the position um, of the colonized in relation to dynamics between England and um, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So sometimes what that means is you'll find yourself um, reading about or, or listening to conversations to do with so-called decoloniality um, and, and the conversations are really centering the experiences of white people who are um, critiquing the power dynamics that exist between Britain's constitutive nations as opposed to speaking about colonization like we are right now and certainly not thinking about the experiences of, of black Asian and racialized people. So I think that's something else in the UK context that is, is very particular to it is how this post-racial myth connects to um, the, these ideas that certain people in devolved nations have to do with those nations being colonized by England, which of course, you know, not to, not to diminish the power dynamics there is absolutely not what we're speaking about when we're talking about colonization. And that's used to shut down often the work of black people, racial justice organizers, and to really diminish the experiences of racialized people there. Yeah, it's it's been fascinating to see how um, how the the, the sort of um, trajectory of the political project of decolonizing, mm -hmm. um, whether that's in the academy or in culture, and how this kind of project has been, you know, yet again appropriated um, from a project that was about colonization and. Um, being a subject of colonization and being taught in school about a certain um, uh, a certain narrative and a certain uh, trajectory that excuses and celebrates really mm -hmm. coloni uh, colonialism, mm -hmm. right? And how that's been appropriated, and you, and you can see this this effort again in the recent the recent kind of political. Um, unrest and struggles over the teaching of critical race theory mm -hmm. in the United States um, and how, you know, this is, you know, there, I was watching something the other day where this white woman was, you know, objecting in, and I, I think it was in Virginia, um, objecting to the teaching of critical race theory and 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 the reporter was kind of being very much more generous than I would have been but very generously saying well don't you think that this um, this history is important 
to teach to, um, you know, kids at school, that's where they learn. And she's like, well, there's some history that's important, but that's just racist. And I just thought, God, the ease with which, you know, white people can say that critical race theory is racist, um, is it kind of maps on to some of the, the, the kind of d- uh, debates I've been seeing in the, I saw in the UK about decolonizing curriculum and that kind of thing. I completely agree. And, and I think, again, accounting for the particular makeup of the UK, uh, this sort of excuse that's often used in relation to a lot of these sorts of issues is so-called statistical insignificance. So if you take somewhere like Scotland, the last census, 2011, around about 1% of the population of Scotland um, were who, or who'd responded to the census anyway were identified as being Black. So people will say, well, there's, there's not that many people. It doesn't matter. Um, it's, it's irrelevant. And, and I think sort of connecting what you just said there and thinking about the UK and the sort of claims that are made, there's still often this, this um, message that there aren't many of those people here, they're not part of the history or that they're new, which really, again, denies the history of immigration, denies the history of colonization um, and, and is completely reframing um, what Britain is, all different parts of it and, and the complicity of all those nations um, in these forms of oppression. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, um, I have a question as we're waiting for other questions, if there are any. Um, do you see do you see a a media campaign or a media company that has um, an, a kind of an, a certain amount of visibility within capitalist culture? Do you see, and this sort of relates to Joe's earlier question, do you see that there is a model? for thinking about capitalist culture, consumer culture, and activism um, in a way that might be generative rather than regressive or might be opening some possibilities rather than foreclosing them. Um, you know, in, in the sense that, you know, uh, you know I'm, I, I'm not at all, um, I'm not at all uh, suggesting that we shouldn't go for the revolution right but in, in you know until we get there you know um is is the, do you see that this there is a space for this kind of thing yes yeah, so what i what i often think about and um, when when sort of discussing these sorts of questions is that there is definitely space for organizations to be doing things differently and to be for me it's it's maybe questions around internally first of all starting with with what's not visible and what's not likely to result in traction for the more publicity and what's going on within that organization what issues to do with inequality power and oppression can be addressed and how might they be sort of outsourcing work and labor in ways that results in you know upholding oppression faced by people in different parts of the world how can resources and be 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 distributed or how can they be supporting the work of, of those on, on the ground and um, addressing the sorts of inequalities that they're wanting to speak about so like you said I think um it's not this sort of either or in that we're not saying we, we can't critique what's what's happening um, and, we're, and we're not saying we can't call for, for changes and for things to be done differently and for me all of this really comes back to visibility and those organizations that perhaps are doing things in a maybe a, a more meaningful way I feel are those organizations that are not necessarily talking about it it's, it's the work that we might not be aware of um, and it's also those organizations that at least have a track record of 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 caring um, in, in relation to, to white supremacy caring in, in terms of how they can support um, racial justice organizers and I think there, there can't there can't be this mismatch between the values and organization espouses and then how we see they are contributing to society or, or are um, doing anything but contributing to society. Um, yeah, I think, you know, um, as you're talking, I, you know, one of the things uh, that, that I think, you know, many of us know um, is that actually doing activist work and challenging structures like white supremacy and, um, and patriarchy is, is actually painful, alienating and difficult work. Right. And and so it's it's, you know, if you're looking at a capitalist culture and a capitalist system, you know, typically the things that are harnessed and and branded and circulated by capitalism aren't those things that are alienating and difficult and painful. That's why cheery pop feminism has such a presence. I mean, who can argue with saying something like you should just be confident, you know, um, or or post-racial discourse has such a 
a hold, you know, like I don't see color, you know, that kind of thing. And so, so it's, it's a really a tricky uh, kind of and vexed often uh, path to, to that. Um, okay, there's a couple more questions. Um, uh, Jessa Lingle has, um, she teaches uh, a, an undergraduate class on pop culture at Annenberg. Um, and she says that students are very suspicious of virtue signaling online. While the course can draw on cultural studies text to talk about how this plays out in terms of corporations and branding, these same critiques are also held up against celebrities or even ordinary people. And I'm not convinced that these theories and she's talking about Frankfurt School and Fisk and Hall and others are still helpful there. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on how to get students thinking about critiquing individuals in a way that allows for calling in rather than calling out. Thanks for that. I'd say I'd, I'd have to start by saying I feel the, the work of Paul is always going to always going to have its relevance. <laughs> so we'll, yes, we'll start definitely. with that and, and, and actually a question that some of my students are, are asking themselves is, you know, how can we take whether it's the, encoding decoding theory or, or theories to do with black popular culture how can we draw on that but also recognize how media has changed then how digital technology has changed how the one-to-many broadcast model has shift shifted and um, but to sort of respond to that question i would say maybe two things i feel as though there's there's definitely space to both call for for or you know to, to allow for calling in rather than calling out but i also think it's important and um, that we, we continue to think critically about the benefits of calling out and and when we're speaking about the sorts of brand critiques that we're discussing today i definitely feel as though those are clear examples of of a call out and, and they could never be anything but that and um, other ways to help students to think critically about this it might be coming back to these questions to do with visibility, representation, and also the, the public and private. When we're dealing with digital technology and we're dealing with social media, there can sometimes, as we keep sort of coming back to be this implication that we're only speaking about stuff that's public and visible to everybody. But I think, for example, questions to do with calling in, how do people make use of more private forms of digital communication to try and, um, you know, wade into these difficult conversations before they sometimes go public? And actually, sometimes what is framed as a call out started out as a call in, but didn't result in that generative conversation and didn't result in that change um, that needed to occur. So, yeah, just I would, I would agree we need space to, to think about calling in. But also, I'd always say that space for calling out is, is, is so important to and here I'm thinking about the work of people such as um, Dr. Meredith Clark and um, looking at the, the etymology um, of, of, of call out culture and also these claims of so-called cancel culture and why it's so important to push back against um, some of the, the insinuations that those people who are being called out are ever really facing um, and any repercussions. Um, it, it's, it's more often than not we see their platform actually seems to expand and then they remain in the spotlight. Yeah, I mean, there's there's quite a there's quite a comeback economy for uh, certain people who are canceled, right? Um, whereas other people, there is not the same kind of access to a comeback or to re-entering in a particular way. And I think that I, I think it's a um, it's it's a super interesting question, Jessa. I mean, I think that um, one of the things too about call out culture is is like is this idea of shame and shaming someone and how that becomes a politics. And I think that if it is directed at an individual, right, it has, it's kind of less um, efficacious politically, right? But mm -hmm. if you shame a structure, a, a system, mm -hmm. uh, an, an ideology, rather than an individual who inhabits a space within that, that actually can be something that doesn't then end up on that slippery slope of shaming in public, which uh, women and people of color have been subject to, you know, always. So it's an interesting, um, it's I, like, like you said, Francesca, I don't think it's either um, or. Um, I, I have another question um, for you that is um, about methods. Um, and again, there are, um, uh, I think lots of graduate students on this um, on, in this conversation who are thinking really about methods and how to use activist methods and what does it mean. And so uh, this is um, from Ajane Truss, who wrote um, that she's curious about the ways in which you use conversation as method um, in your book. Um, and, and, and how do you think 
of conversation as speaking to your black feminist epistemolo epistemology um, and, and, and maybe thinking about what are some of the differences and are they differences that make a difference between conversation as a method and interview as a method? Mm, thank you. I, yeah, I feel as though conversation as a method um, has played such a central part in, in so much of the work that I've done and so much of the work that I'm doing. And it maybe connects to that sort of black feminist epistemology in terms of thinking about knowledge production as being beyond the academic journal article that's behind a paywall and um, thinking about knowledge as, as being rooted in lived experience and also sort of the back and forth nature of conversations. They, conversations in some ways you could say they never really have just a start and an end. There's often always this, this dialogue and um, whether that's conversations between people or a person and an archival um, resource that they might be engaging with. So for me, I'd say that question to do with methods, I always feel as though I want there to be space for um, reflexivity, for remembering that, you know, in order for something to, to be perceived as, as citable, it doesn't need to be written down. It can sometimes be a fleeting moment. And also knowing that the, all the work that I've done, whether it's been so authored or co-authored, is, is largely based on the, these dialogues and these conversations. And I think this is where oral histories are, are so crucial. And the work I've been doing with a good friend and independent researcher and organizer, Leila Roxanne Hill on Black History in Scotland, has involved these conversations, these oral histories, and just remembering the significance of, of these discussions with people and how much is lost um, when, when that sort of work is, is overlooked or dismissed just because it doesn't seem to have sort of the institutional seal of approval. Yeah, I think that's um, so helpful. I mean, not, not just for early career researchers who are kind of embarking on new projects, but also for all of us to think about, you know, what the ways in which institutional context, context institutional pressures, institutional politics always, already kind of um, foreclose some possibilities and, and what research is and what we can talk about and, and what methods we can use. Um, so um, I, I really appreciate that kind of, you know, that use of conversation um, in, in the book. Um, we are now out of time. Um, I, this has been an amazing conversation. I always learn so much from hearing you talk and from reading your work. Um, and um, I wish um, either you could be in Philadelphia or we could be in Wales, um, but next time um, <laughs> we'll try to do something like that. Um, but, um, you know, again, thank you so much for writing this book and for doing this work um, and for sharing it with us uh, today. It's been really, really great. Thank you so much. It's, it's been an incredible conversation and also really appreciative of all the questions and all that's been shared here today. Great. Thank you so much. OK, I'll, I'll do my little reaction clap here um, since we can't clap. But um, uh, again, thanks so much, Francesca. And um, um, good luck with the book. Um, and um, and I'm sure we will uh, you know, talk again soon. Thank you.